Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, GDC Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am, as always, the invisible voice inside your head. Um, I am here today playing a game called Heaven's Vault. Um, it comes to you from the folks at Inkle, based out of Cambridge. You guys are in Cambridge, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. we are. Okay, I'm going to actually need you, uh, I'm going to need to do something down here real quick. John has unfortunately, you can't see John down there, everyone, but we have both Joe and John. Yeah, there we go. Oh, We're gonna have to get turn, a bit yeah, uncomfortable you, place. I think. Yeah, <laughs> the middle of your webcam is where we are. Uh, if you want to turn it a bit more towards John, I think. Um, anyway, we're here today uh, with some lovely folks in chat. I already see Clifton B out there. Uh, I think I saw someone else, but I refreshed the page and I lost their name. Um, hi, everyone in chat. Um, we are here today. Like I said, we're playing Heaven's Vault. It is just releasing today. It is a narrative archaeology game where uh, you can walk around, have great interactive conversations with people, with great interesting characters. The setting is probably my favorite part of the game. Um, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, right now, we are looking for uh, the friend of uh, uh, the archaeol of another academic type who we're friends with. So we're on a, it's kind of a friend goes missing, ancient mysteries kind of quest, um, which is how Indiana Jones starts. But this game takes a very different tack from Indiana Jones. Um, Alex, I need you to introduce yourself, even though a lot of folks probably know who you are. Hey, what's up? My name is Alex Warrow. I uh, am a contributing editor at GalmasFuture.com, and I help out on GDC. And most importantly, I skipped lunch to be here. And I'm just now starting to <laughs> I regret it. not to. <laughs> I but luckily... Getting his rumblings in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no joke. We have uh, two very special guests here who can do most of the hard thinking for me. Special guests, will you tell everyone who you are and what you do, please? Hey, I'm Joe. I'm a gameplay director at Inkle. And I'm John. I'm the narrative director here at Inkle. Welcome. Yeah. Brian, where are you? I forget the planet name, going to be honest. We're in somewhere <laughs> in the middle of the Cyclones, which is... Okay. So this game takes place in a nebula, um, which is in a set of moons in a nebula. Instead of navigating through what's kind of a traditional space setting, you... you um, uh, yeah, I know they don't take place naturally. We're a robot. Um, so instead of a tr navigating through like a traditional space setting, you ride these rivers, uh, around the nebula, um, and we have made our way to an unknown moon, uh, way back in the sort of uncharted waters of this place. Um, nice. we've been down to the planet's surface, there's kind of, I, me and my robot pal, um, are here looking for our friend, we have a clue that let us hear about this robe, um, so, you know, lost civilization, uh, mysteries to explore, um, Unfortunately, for everyone in chat, I will point out, reading games are often some of the hardest to stream because I have to read and process information that I need to use later and talk to our illustrious guests. Um, so uh, for now, I am going to uh, work on uh, this gameplay and toss a question out to our guests. Um, would you please introduce uh, Heaven's Vault from your perspective? I think you've been working on it since uh, shortly after 80 Days wrapped up, right? Yeah, that's right. So 80 Days... Shipped in 2014, back when the world was a normal and sane place. <laughs> and, thought, uh, and that did quite well for us. And we thought, uh, let's do something ambitious. Let's see what we can do that isn't just like 81 days or 240 days. Let's, let's try and do something different and something special. So we decided to do something graphical. We decided to try and go to PlayStation, make them into consoles. And we didn't really know what else we wanted to do. And then we spent quite a while kind of landing on a concept that really attracted us and kind of had enough in it. And I think we ended up with a concept with with quite a lot, quite a lot in it, actually, in the end. <laughs> <laughs> About four years of work. <laughs> yeah. it. it was supposed to be a sort of ambitious, you know, maybe year and a half project and four years later. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, we're now a studio of eight people, seven people, whereas yeah. we were... Yeah, too. So it's been quite a it's been quite a long and complicating process getting to this point, but uh, it's done. It's actually yeah. done, and it works, and it's yeah. out there. Like people are playing it. I find this very surprising still because it was it was quite it was it was a sort of idea that we thought might be possible, and we weren't entirely sure that it was actually going to be the sort of thing one could actually do. We thought we were going to get halfway through it and then go, nah, this isn't working. We have to stop now. Um, so, yeah. I know. I'm yeah. a bit of a surprise. I've got launch day surprise. 
Yeah, ain't that always how it goes? Um, real quick, before we jump in, I want to say now that we have a good quorum going here in chat, if you have any questions for these two, please, by all means, drop them in chat. Brian and I will uh, relay them, and it would be a big help, because like I said, Brian's got some mysteries to solve, so mm-hmm. uh, we need your good, smart questions, preferably about game development, game design, and this game particularly. Um, yeah, I mean, this is launch day. I mean, we were talking before the stream. It's it's late over there. It's about 10 p.m. How are you guys feeling so far? I literally just stepped in back into the office after going out for a launch dinner with the whole team. Uh, so that was nice. Where'd you go? <laughs> uh, we went to a place called Al Kasbah, which is an Algerian restaurant. Nice. Yeah. Very, very sure. Yeah, <laughs> on brand. Definitely. There's a, there's a location in the game. You can go to the moon where Aaliyah really, uh, uh, grew up and there's a bar there run by a bartender and that bar is modeled on i mean it's modeled on places in morocco really but like it's modeled on this this restaurant down the road that we went to as good as anywhere else mm-hmm. like that's our closest local reference for that sure. style of <laughs> so, right on. I like the on-brand place to go um we already have a good question here in chat and it kind of dovetails with what i want to get into which is uh you know, I, what's so, so striking about Heaven's Vault is the look and the the spaces that you you traverse. Um, this is, as far as I know, the first like really three D navigatable um, sort of like game compared to you've ever made. Because the earlier games, they were all based on like choosing dialogue options and moving through uh, interactive stories. And there's a question here from Dainty Rhino who wants to know what's the purpose of these faded ghosts that appear whenever the character moves. So the whole um, theme of the game is history and archaeology. So we quite liked the idea that as an archaeologist, while she's exploring these sites, and maybe she's she's leaving her own footprint on the sites as she explores them because she's changing history herself. So wherever she stands, whatever she does, she leaves uh, almost like a a memory which fades as she moves away again. Mm -hmm. Um, She saw just there. Um, so it's just to give that sense of history and the sense of memories and creating um, a new history herself. It's a funny thing because like we we've been through a bunch of different takes on the animation style over the course of the project. You know, we, we've had a lot of different ideas and we have used a lot of different variants of crossfading frames. And at one point we took those ghosts out completely mm. and we missed them. Mm. We just missed them. The, the thing felt a little bit throwaway. It felt like you were just, you know when you have a video game character and they're just buzzing around an environment and they're just running from place to place and they're just scooping everything up and they don't really exist in the world at all. They're just kind of, they're just like a mouse pointer scrubbing across the screen. Mm. And that's how we interact in 3D spaces. And it wasn't quite heavy enough. Like, you're supposed to be in this world. So that little, just that little thing that gets left behind just gives you a note of you really were there and you can't, if you buzz around the level, then it looks like she's doing something crazy, which she is actually. Hmm. Every time we took it out, it kind of looked worse. So we kept putting it back in again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those bits of feedback can be interesting that way. I think to me, watching Brian play, it, it sort of, it resonates with the game's themes, which seem to be this idea that um, spaces can be so many different things and they can be used in so many different ways by different people throughout time and people leave pathways right as they go about their lives and so you're seeing very in a very physical way and in a very like uh what seems like a resource uh a light way compared to like um something like in god of war where you can like actually see the character's footsteps through the snow and incredibly rich detailed like very expensive technology um but here you have this like very simple reminder that where she is is like a, pa- a place in space as well as time i think that's really interesting um oh man there's so many good questions here if you guys have a second clifton b has a question here that is sort of unrelated, but I think it's fascinating. How much prep work do you do before you jump into ink? And what tools do you use in your process for, I guess, sort of narrative design and, and implementing storylines? For, for, we should clarify for those at home, ink is, is uh, Inkle's mm. game writing tool. I believe it's out. It's oh, it's available for other devs to use because it's open source. Oh, yeah. Open source, yeah. Okay. So, so. The, the whole point of ink is that it's an incredibly editable. So we do not do any planning or prototyping outside of ink. When I, if I want to write a scene, if I want to write some dialogue, if I want to start getting to know the characters, I just write some ink. And then as the structure gets more complicated, you start taking bits of that ink and maybe putting it somewhere else or packaging it up in another wrapper so that it can become part of a scene rather than just a standalone bit of dialogue. But you're just throwing script around. So it's actually very, very quick. 
mm. and easy to do. So all of this stuff has evolved and evolved and evolved from very basic prototype scripts. The original kind of first third of the game, but you're just about at the end of the first third here, the kind of opening plot section. And that was originally knocked out as a script in ink um, in one afternoon. Like these are the basic beats that the player will go through during that tutorial section. And that's right. just evolved into place to become this 3D world within environmental conversations and all the kind of things that you do within that world, mm. sort of step by step by step. So yeah, I, I get quite dogmatic about this. We, we don't do any kind of planning. We do things when we need to do it. So if I need to work out the flow of a scene, I'll get a piece of paper and a pen and I'll draw a flow chart to help my brain work. But we don't do any formalized process. We don't have any kind of spreadsheet construction process or anything. It tends to be whatever the level needs. I think a sort okay. of nice okay. thing Ink is the way uh, it kind of adapts to what your needs are. So if some people like to really plan in advance and create flowcharts for absolutely everything, then they can, and then they can fill in the boxes in terms of writing little snippets. Um, but it's just, we try to make tools that kind of fit your own workflow, basically. Right. And I think to say that my writing workflow is super ad hoc. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's so, I mean, bearing that in mind, like, uh, how, how did you approach the sort of uh, conception and narrative design of this game as a whole? You know, like, what was your... Like, because I'm, I'm fascinated as I watch uh, Brian play and as I look forward to playing myself, like, this seems very difficult to construct. Like, it's a it's a bunch of interlocking puzzles and, and sort of uh, uh, interesting conversations and, and choices. How did you go about structuring it from the beginning? Was it really just you just started going and then kind of made it as you went along? Or did you have, like, uh, a formal structure for how you uh, create these narratives and branch them? We changed the way that you walk around, but, but basically, you could walk around. John, could you lean forward and start that answer again? You you suddenly lost. It. You got really I just, quiet. I just oh, turned my volume way up. <laughs> yes. So, um, I think when we started the project, we had a very clear sense of what the player would be doing in the world. They would be walking around and interacting with things, and then talking about things as they interacted with them, and then as you walk the next place, you would be walking as you sorry, talking as you walk from point to point. That was kind of our core loop idea, was walk and talks and interaction plot. And then actually working out how to author that in ink was about a year's worth of work mm -hmm. because finding a pattern which allowed you to author it flexibly enough that you didn't have to, that you could do whatever you needed to do, but that wasn't so complicated that you have to constantly look up how to do it or break it the whole time. Finding a right sort of balance for scripting it, that was a really long and difficult iterative process. So I think we, we kind of had initial scripts within a, a couple of months, I guess, um, that did do that. They did the walking around and the talking, but they were a real pain to author. They were too fiddly. They were very, very fragile. And over the course of the project, we slowly worked out things that we were doing a lot of that we could extract into other ways. So. Um, for example, the way the conversation in the game works, uh, originally conversations were tied specifically to rooms and things you were looking at because that's the easiest thing to do, right? You, you go to somewhere and you have a conversation about it. And what we have now is a system where they're walking around in an environment, but the game is feeding conversation options in from a bank of conversation that it has all the time, which is triggered by the knowledge model that it's tracking in the game. So what you know and what you don't know says, well, these conversations are relevant, these ones aren't. And all of that is sculpted in ink. All of that is crafted in ink. And yeah, it took a long time to build that structure and make it work. After mm. the dead air of that I can't remember what the question was now, but it's a long time. This guy. Like, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it was a really complicated engine to build, but I think what we started with was a very clear idea that it ought to be possible to build this thing this way. Mm. We just had to find a pattern that allowed the author, the human being writing it, not to get totally baffled by what they were doing. Yeah. Um, that, that's the major limiting factor, really. But right to the bottom level, because, I mean, right um, from the very early prototypes, we had this idea that we could use the same text engine to basically not just produce prose as we did on 80 Days, but produce line-by-line 
uh, lines are basically an interactive film script. Mm -hmm. So each line is either a scene direction like show this camera shot, play this sound, play this kind of sequence, or it's actual lines of dialogue. So, um, and then the engine takes these line by line and presents them in a visual way. Um, and that never changed. That was, and we, we changed the, the high level structuring quite a lot in, the, in order to fit the, uh, the, the continually evolving uh, game design. But that general approach stayed consistent throughout, even from right at the beginning when it was basically, it was, a, it was almost a 2D game with like static comic book panels yeah. where you made choices, you made dialogue choices in a kind of static top 2D um, comic book panel and then it went from panel to panel. Mm -hmm. uh, but fundamentally, you know, John was writing in the same way then as he did towards the end. Um, it's just that the whole game has changed in between. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, I guess when, when we're making this stuff, we have a really we have an ongoing discussion the whole time of what's in the game and what's in the ink. And we see those as two quite separate things. So the ink is, is, should be in control of all the narrative stuff and all the presentation stuff and all the sequencing stuff and all the stuff that wants to be flexible depending on what the player might or might not have done. Mm. All the fiddly stuff that lets you, so that when you get to the end of the project, you can redraft it. So that when you get to the end of the project, you can make this particular line of dialogue not actually appear under that specific circumstance because that's the sort of thing that Ink's really good at. Um, and then the game side has to cover all the things which are <coughs> systemic, which we don't want to have to bother authoring specifically every time. So like when you're talking to another human being, it drops into a, a two shot, which sort of goes over the shoulder between each character. Right. And that's within the game code, because you don't want the ink to have to worry about that. Mm. The ink doesn't even want to have to tell yeah. the game that that's happening. The game just goes, all mm. oh, human beings are talking to each other. Time for a two-shot. Which is kind of exciting, because um, you can just write a load of dialogue without any scene instructions at all, and it will present it in an interesting way in the, in, in the engine, which is yeah, which which kind, is of, kind of a magical right? and process. What's really great about that is then I can take a dialogue sequence which was written for one location and pick mm. it up and stick it in another location, and it will just work. And it will just yeah. work. And Mm -hmm. in the game where you can have the same conversation with the same character in five, six different places in the world, just depending on how you happen to meet them. Right. From, a, from our point of view at all. Yeah, that's, that's super rich. That's so oh, cool. Oh, like, that's yeah. magic. That sounds like magic. I'm sorry. Yeah, just like the idea that you can write a scene and then have the engine sort of programmatically figure out the, the, the shot reverse shot of it with, and then not worry about like, like from a direction perspective. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah well, it's incredibly liberating as well. And like, obviously games, games like The Witcher do this, you know, games like uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey do this. They have programmatic two shots mm -hmm. um, that they use to cover or like programmatic anims that, that are kind of brought in just to keep scenes alive when they haven't authored something specific to override it. And ideally you never notice that they're doing that, but I'm absolutely sure that they are doing that. Um, we have the advantage of not having, because we don't have voice acting, we don't have continuous animation, we can cut between procedural stuff and scripted stuff incredibly fluidly without it being particularly noticeable. Um, so we can really push that to quite absurd extremes. So mm -hmm. you can have the same, yeah, you can have the same conversations with the same people in wildly different contexts. And the game. Yeah. Um I'm I'm curious. And before we move on to Claire, I wanted to know, did this did this game's design and development influence the design and development of Ink? Uh, and if so, like how has how has the the language changed uh, as a result of your work on Heaven's Vault? I mean, it's kind of stayed remarkably static. We've developed it over time, but most of the major advances that we made in Ink happened at the very start of this project. There's been like one or two extra features that we've added. But. Yeah, it's worth noting that a lot of the design of Heaven's Vault comes from the design of Sorcery, despite the fact they're very, very different games. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what we're doing in Heaven's Vault is just taking something that we prototyped in Sorcery and pushing it really, really far. So Sorcery had basic knowledge modeling and scenes dropped in contextually if they happen to be relevant right now. Mm -hmm. Heaven's Vault built entirely out of that. Sorcery used it in specific places, but but there were a few features, like um, lists. lists. Yeah. yeah, Ink has a, a data structure called a list, which I think when we when you first pitched it, I had no idea how powerful <laughs> it was going to be. 
And you were like, well, it's sort of this and it's sort of that and it sort of does both of those. And I was like, we don't need that. And you were like, yeah, but we can do it. And now, <laughs> like, I build everything out of this thing. Um, nice. Programming speak is basically they're enums uh, or flags, uh, but they're so much more powerful than that. They're kind of also a bit like mathematical sets. And the way we use it is for state tracking. So whether it's your inventory or all of the things that uh, you know about or whatever. Mm. Um, and we just track kind of pools of th these facts, essentially. Chris Remo did a talk at GDC this year about the fact system that they had in Firewatch. Mm. I, I, I only caught the second half of it. I need to catch up on the vault. But um, I was kind of entertained listening to it because we have a fact tracking system in Heaven's Vault, which has something like three and a half thousand facts. And every single line in the game is sort of saying, do you know these facts, but you don't know these facts, in which case this line is appropriate. And this is the, how the whole system works. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's fine, actually. It turns out it's very, yeah. very manageable because they're all contextual. So you just look up ones that are relevant. Um, right. Yeah. That, you know, so that definitely was a feature that we were building originally using quite a hacky system. Kind of got wrapped into the language, mm. which is I good. <laughs> I don't know if we all remember. Um, it's been a journey, but this question started sort of out of a question about uh, how you how you sort of create the how you your process for writing the narrative of this game. Um, before we move on, I want to get the last part of Clifton B's question because it was kind of interesting. They wanted to know um, basically like they always have their narrative super solid before they start implementing, and they want to know like do you ever realize things you've missed after you've started implementing a storyline in your editor, and if so, like. Uh, how does that shape your game design? Whether it's a game like this or a game like 80 Days, like um, how do you uh, how do you figure out what to incorporate in a game, even when you're say uh, six months from ship and you've already got most of the narrative written down? Like, yeah. So <laughs> the thing that the whole so this business of building a structure where we we write the ink and the game code processes it was very difficult. But the payoff for that is um, two weeks before we ship. I was playing through the game and I found a scene that I didn't like. I just didn't like it at all. The okay. dialogue was rubbish. So I took half a day and I rewrote it entirely. Every single line of it was changed. The entire flow of that scene was changed. And I just took the file, rewrote it, tested it, swapped it out, and then it was in the game changed. Like we were already in beta testing at this point. Like we already, I think, had sent a code off of PlayStation's FQA process. You know, Dangerous. Like, significantly late in the process, but it isn't dangerous because actually it's very easy to test a scene in isolation in ink and make sure that you're really very happy with it. And actually there's no cost to it. I don't need to talk to anyone else. I don't need to talk to the environment people or the character people or the animation people or anyone else. Like I can just go off and do that on my own and come back with it and say, yep, that's better. And we constantly do that. So I think if Heaven's Vault has a good story or it has good characters or it has good good moments it's not because we plan things cleverly in advance it's because we plan something that was okay and we've got a really good system for trading up so every scene in this game has been traded up to make it stronger or tighter or better all the bits that we didn't need we cut and all the bits that could be stronger we developed and um the freedom to do that as a writer like film writers, script writers on films do this all the time. They are constantly rewriting screenplays on the day of shooting. That's normal in the film industry. In the games industry, you're supposed to lock your script six months in advance and still be happy with it by the time you ship. And that's a hell of an ask. And yeah, breaking that assumption definitely comes with some compromises in terms of the fidelity of what we can achieve. But the payoff in terms of the fluidity of the narrative i just wouldn't do it any other way like it's the reason that 80 days was good is because we were editing it editing it up editing it right up until the last minute um the reason that sorcery was good the same reason heaven's vault i think it's 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 true there as well um i mean we're massively taking advantage of the fact that we don't we're not fully voiced we're not fully animated so we we're kind of we, we're able to pour all of our energy into refining the core storytelling. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's a funny thing, though, because people looking at it sometimes say, oh, well, it would have been nice if it would be fully voiced. And you go, you know what, actually, if it would have been fully voiced, it would have been a significantly worse script. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I also fair. I also want to chime in on on what fully voiced can mean for developers. Um, or from the player side, fully voiced often means like I'm often sitting. I can't read the conversation at my own pace. I have to read it at the actor's pace. And often there's some very very great. Uh, um, uh, you know, performances in there, but that, like, I forget what I was playing. Oh, yeah, it was Horizon Zero Dawn. I was playing the other day, and I was, like, resist, resisting the urge to just keep, uh, to just keep, um, skipping past cutscenes because I wanted to, you know, hear the the drama of it, but that's another thing that I don't think, I don't think, I don't hear it said aloud a lot, but, like, yeah. no, I, I think, yeah, we're always talking about this, and, um, I think, you know, there are solutions, but the solutions are in the core game design. I kind of see that, like, the voice that you have to listen to occupies a small part of your brain, but then the rest of your brain is left unoccupied. And if you can fill it with other related gameplay, like, um, you know, Firewatch and games in that kind of genre, you know, it works because you're able to explore while communicating and listening to the dialogue. If you only had to just sit and listen to the dialogue and do nothing else, it wouldn't be as playable. Um, and so, yeah, you could do a fully voiced Heaven's Vault, of that kind of style of game, but you'd have to find ways of occupying the rest of the player's brain while the dialogue is going on. No, I mean, I think there's a... I don't know that I even agree with that entirely. I think there's a, there's a question of scope as well, like the amount of information you can communicate in text that you read in your head is just a lot higher than the amount you can oh, communicate yes. when you're doing voice acted stuff. And it it depends on what kind of story you want to tell yeah. and what you want to talk about. But like delivering exposition through spoken dialogue is one of the worst things in the world. Like films try to avoid it as much as possible because um, it's just deathly dull. But you can do it in prose much more effortlessly because people just read it and they grok it and it's gone. And like, if you understand your medium, you can take advantage of that and you can do things with it. And yeah, this this idea that we we should just be making the flashiest version of everything, so that didn't impact the content that you can deliver, mm -hmm. seems to me to be a bit wrongheaded. Um, yeah. I'm very happy. That's the thing. As a writer, I'm very happy. <laughs> I, I I would like to uh, steer steer the conversation a little bit towards. Oh, this is a really compelling scene, so I'm having trouble reading it, but I would need to get this question in. Um, uh, Devraw is asking about um, uh, uh, how, uh, their question is: Have you met or contacted Jordan Mechner during the development process? Considering this has a uh, Last Express vibes, I haven't played Last Express myself, so I can't uh, testify to that. Um, I wanted to ask you though about the setting in general because there's a few key things beyond just sort of the um, uh, Asian, East, Middle East, Southeast Asian kind of vibe of the game. Is also um, this very strange intertwining of, of a mystical and scientific world? Because you have robots that are dug up from the ground, you have a nebula where people sail on it like the river. Um, this is cool. This is really cool. And while I think it would be nice to hear about if, if you did talk to Mr. Mechner, um, I just want to know more about making this setting in a in a world where game developers I feel like have to fight for interesting settings with every game, or they risk feeling like you know a knockoff of some other game that's already existed. Yeah. Uh, so no, we we've, we've never spoken to to Jordan Mechner. Um, but, but The Last Express is my favorite game of all time. Like, it's just an astonishingly good piece of writing and wonderful, wonderful concept. Um, it's funny how that it's, it's almost like luck that we ended up being similar to Last Express. I know it's your like, mm. favorite, <laughs> but like, I mean, I, in terms of the structure, I'm sure yeah. you took influence, but in terms of the art style, mm. like, it takes a lot of. Well, you could say it takes influence, and we came from a totally different direction. I think I remember a point when we were talking about this, and we, we, we tried this, and we tried that, and we tried the other, and you were like, oh, bloody hell, let's just do the last <laughs> <laughs> Like We ended up with this almost rotoscoped look, but yeah. yeah. So the setting, uh, if you want to dive into how you cooked up the setting. Yeah, the setting was hard. Actually, and when we started, we, we'd, we'd always worked on all other IPs previously. So obviously 80 Days is an adaptation of an IP and Sorcery is too. And Joe was very keen on, on making our own IP and I really didn't want to because I knew it would be difficult. Turns um, out it's a lot of work. Yeah, it turns out it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. um, 
but I think the it was a it was a really long and torturous process. I think we started with a few things that we were sure of. So we wanted the the nebula, the, the rivers in space, was a core idea yeah. that we started with, which came from kind of landscapes that you were interested yeah, in cause, visually. Yeah, because we're um, we're just thinking that like usually when space is represented in games, it's kind of like this black void of emptiness and like hard steel, hard sci-fi, and we love that idea that you could create a version of space which is more like one of these beautiful neb nebulas that you see through the Hubble telescope, that's beautiful, colorful, rich, and dense, dense yeah, really dense. Exactly. Um, as you said, more like a natural landscape of rivers and mountains, where the mountains are, are like big cloud banks. Yeah, and that, that coupled into um, an image that comes from Egyptian mythology of the gods sailing barges through the rivers of stars, Yeah, um, which is how they the, the, the way that Ra travels across the, the sky, and that felt like a that felt like a cool association to play with, but not necessarily a concrete piece of world building. <laughs> it didn't really help very much. Mm. Um, and I, I think there was about a, maybe even a year where I would just wake up in the morning, try to do some writing, and think, "Yeah, but why are there rivers in space? Why are there rivers in space?" <laughs> and I would ask people in the office, "Why are there rivers in space?" And they would say, oh, "It doesn't matter." And I go, "No, I really think we need to know this." Um, and then at some point, I had an idea for why there are rivers in space, which I'm not going to share because it's a huge spoiler. Mm -hmm. um, but from that, everything else followed. And then the most of the rest of the building of the setting was trying to stick to a couple of basic ground rules. Um, so I was hugely inspired by the, the work of Ursula Le Guin and Jean Wolfe to Jean Wolfe died. Rest, rest in peace, Mr. Wolfe, because I think he just passed yesterday. Yeah. Wonderful writer, um, but they both. Le Guin's stuff is incredibly empathetic, and I love that. And very based around sort of humans and what humans do and how they shape things. And Wolf's stuff is not particularly empathetic. But one thing that he does very well is that he tends to have one core magic in his world that then manifests in multiple ways that the people in the world don't realize are the same thing, mm -hmm. which is a neat trick for building a sci-fi setting because it makes everything feel connected even though everything is also disparate so you get a sense of wonder but a sense that it all comes from the same it's somehow cut from the same cloth mm. it bridges the line between magic and science in a way like yeah the, exactly because the problem with magic is that it's arbitrary the problem yeah. with your your kind of ha harry potter is well next week <clears throat> harry potter might get a spell to do something else completely random that you didn't know existed in this world and like well why didn't dumbledore just pass the win the game spell and then everything's fine um and that's a problem um, if you want to kind of make your world compelling, especially if the player doesn't understand it and they're going to explore it. Um, but if you if you lay out the like lots of technological rules in the way that Star Trek does, you end up with this incredibly complicated world that's very inaccessible for people coming into it new. So ideally, what you have is two rules with interesting consequences. And so we tried to do that. We tried to make our world set up in a way that um, that, that would follow. And so everything in the world comes from these two technological ideas that we had, which kind of come out in lots of different interesting ways. And then that led us to natural places in the narrative. And then you think, well, how can I express this narrative? And it all kind of twists around itself. And mm -hmm. uh, you bring in things which are interesting and you cut them into the And there was lots of research that kind of inspired various themes and moments in the game. And then you have to work out why they make sense and yeah, it was horrendous actually it was really hard um <laughs> of course, you don't have, just have to build a world in the present you have to create five thousand years <laughs> of history well, i resisted aware. that for so long for so long i was like it'll be fine we'll just make stuff up it won't matter and then i realized that i couldn't do it like i genuinely actually needed to know what happened three and a half thousand years ago in order to write this location yeah, the spoilers so, um, are on the back wall though oh, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that's Luckily, the that's that's a very tiny. They're very tiny on that screen. There, feel free to enhance our 720p broadcast <laughs> to try and pick out a few pixels in the lower left-hand corner with our moderately okay encoding. It's probably easier to just play the game, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. It, so it it was a really long and difficult process and I think one thing uh, we've had we've seen a lot of reviews today and one thing that's been common across the reviews is people saying you know they really like this world it feels like a really fleshed out real world and that's incredibly good to hear <laughs> because it was really hard work but I think the thing that makes it hang together is just 
we, we have tried to shave it back at all times and make sure that it does really genuinely make sense with itself. So um, there's a lot of places where in the game, there's like symbology that just works. So in, at the beginning of the game, you're introduced to this symbol called the Eagle and Sun, which is the symbol of the empire that was around in this nebula before sort of before a cataclysm happened and it was destroyed. And one of the questions that the game never explicitly asks is what the hell is an eagle and what the hell is a sun to the people in this nebula? Mm. But I know the answers to these questions and they're in there and they make sense. And like the fact that that tracks is not an accident, but it does make the, the world feel robust, even if no one ever talks about it. Um, yeah. Uh, John, I have a question as, as someone who's, I've done some work, you know, I've, I, I know that the pro how the process of writing different kinds of games can go. What, it is very easy to fall down the trap of, of building out loads and loads of beautiful lore and knowledge and information about your game. Um, you, you are all lucky in that you have a game that wants to use that lore and knowledge, um, but how, when you only have so much time to make a, a game that needs to pay for your, you know, your meal, your family's meal, how do you properly categorize you, you can make an argument that you know all the writing work you do even if it gets cut is worth it because it helps you do something else but how do you make sure you're not like falling down a rabbit hole when you're in a space like that so um i think it's actually the same as designing interactive fiction in general possibly the same as designing games in general that you have to think as a player and then you also have to think as a as a creator so mm -hmm. you have to think as a writer, and you also have to think as a reader. So as a writer, I say, well, I've got my lore and I've got all these things that I'm interested in, they're all really cool. But as a reader, I don't give a damn about your lore at all. Mm -hmm. What I want is the characters, the adventures, the motivation, the mystery. I want to know what's happening next. And if your lore isn't relevant to that, I don't care about it. And I shouldn't care about it. And there will be readers who do, but they're not the important one. The important reader is the reader who just wants to be told a good story and then go home. And the important player of your game is one who just wants to have fun. That's all they want to do. They just want to have something to do. Mm -hmm. And and by f you have to flip between those two viewpoints all the time. Like it's no good to go away and write out a great big law book and then be really proud of yourself because you've basically you've just entertained an audience of one and that's it. <laughs> like you haven't done anything. Um, you've got to think about the performance the whole time. So I try to write as little law as possible all the time but be thinking about the way that um, scenes will actually play or what will actually happen in the game. And then when I realize I don't know something, then I go back to the lore and I kind of construct the lore that makes sense within that. And then I go back to the gameplay. And flip-flopping between those two, you eventually reach a point where both are satisfied. Um, I think that's true of all of our designs. You know, like if we're designing the translation game, we're thinking about, well, how does this work as a language, but how does this work as a thing the player can solve? And both of those things are fighting, and you're trying to find the tension, the balance between the two. Because um, if you go too far one way, you end up with something incomprehensible, and you go too far the other way, you end up with something that's just trivial, and neither of those are interesting. Um, so I think you know, that's the whole job. Like, that's <laughs> the whole job. Um, is not, anyone can have ideas, like really, actually, anyone can have ideas, and it's, a question of how do you make ideas that you can play out in an interesting way is that's, that's, what, that's what we're doing. That's what all of us are doing all of the time. <laughs> yeah, no joke. Um, before we move on, there's a question that dovetails very well with this, which is from Statue Stat. They want to know how much background research on archaeology, history, etc. did you do to help build these worlds? That was a long look. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, you start with research, but you start with research that inspires you. I'm not very good at researching for research's sake. I tend to like drop in and out of stuff. So uh, my starting point on this project was a 1960s book of archaeological, of schlock archaeology called Citadels of Mystery, which goes through 12 archaeological sites and comes up with some crazy theories about what they might be. So it's like Machu Picchu was a test village in the mountains and um, it was built purely to see if people could survive up there and they didn't. This is not a very plausible theory, but this is the theory in this book. And it's 
brilliant because it takes real archaeological evidence and it plays with it and it has fun. And that inspired me a lot. And it's a superb book and I hugely enjoyed it. Everything and that was one of my primary researches. But mm -hmm. to say that I just read this one book and wrote the game is also not true. Like, I know a ton of archaeologists. My dad is a, an anthropologist. I've met them all my life. Um, yeah, like, it, one, you, you end up bringing together a lot of sources that you didn't deliberately look for. Um, because we chose to write this game for a reason, you know. Mm. Um, mm. And I think that goes across the team as well. Like, Tom used to talk a lot about religion. Like, mm. that was something he was really interested yeah. in bringing into a sci-fi context, and that's definitely fed through into the mm. game. Um, right on. Um, there are more questions in the chat that are very, very good, but I have one that I wanted to ask since the start, so I'm just going to throw it out there. What... How how tricky was it to put this into a 3D context? This is your first 3D navigatable like game. Uh, to tell me a bit about how that went for you, because it must have been uh, tricky at best. Like, uh, what what engine and tools did you use to build these 3D worlds, and like how did you end up uh, deciding how to build them as these kind of quasi 3D storybook spaces that they came out as? Uh, so we built it in Unity. Um... <laughs> And we basically started from the point of, um, as I said earlier, we wanted to make a 2D comic book, essentially, um, but a dynamic, interactive comic book. And what that would mean, and part, part of the reason we wanted to do that is because we loved um, we loved 2D character illustration because they can, because 2D, 2D character illustration can be really expressive. Um, so we wanted to draw our characters from lots of different angles um, uh, so that we could dynamically compose these uh, panels. And we constructed our environments in 3D. They were initially a lot simpler than the environments here just because we wanted to create the sense of a background rather than uh, construct entire worlds in 3D. But as we created this and we created the main protagonist, Aaliyah, and we drew her from... 12 different angles, her core pose. Um, we just loved the overall effect of moving the camera around in 3D because we created a, a system that basically has a database of character frames and depending on uh, the camera's angle and uh, certain tags that's been applied to her character, like whether she's in a particular walk uh, or a talk or some emotion, um, then it would pick a different overall body frame and also paste a different facial expression over the top so we could get all of these different effects. Um, and then, yeah, the 3D basically came out of that as we were experimenting with what you could do um, because we wanted it to initially just be 2D uh, comic book panels, but then uh, seeing, seeing the effect of all of that happening in 3D, we just thought it looked really cool. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. I imagine. Um, did that change the way you you did your sort of how you structured the pace and flow of the game? Like, how much how much of what you might call level design went into this game, and like, how did the decision to go full three D change the way you structured it, if at all? Oh, I think it massively changed things because um, as soon as you go full three D, you can you get the ability to poke around in all of the little tiny corners of the level, mm. uh, just like any other 3D game. Um, and we've kind of, we've been through an evolution to get to that point, because at the beginning, we had a very limited amount of interactivity in that it was kind of a visual choice-based narrative. Um, so that the narrative was really driving it. There was not so much exploration at all. You could only interact with whatever it gave you choices for. Um, but as we opened it up, like we, we were talking for a while about having 3D environments, but maybe you, you have a completely fixed camera angle, a bit like a point and click adventure, so that within, with, from that particular camera perspective, you could poke around in these corners, but it wasn't fully interactive. But as soon as you can swing the camera all the way around, there's just so much more scope for uh, where you can go, what you should be able to interact with because it's right there. Mm. That had an impact right down into the script because then suddenly your branching narrative script needs to be able to cope with a player who walks over to one side of the room and does one thing, walks over to the other side of the room and does another thing, then walks back to the first side of the room again 
which is not a branching tree structure even slightly. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's something completely different. Because in, um, in sorcery, like when we have uh, waypoints on the on the, the mini maps, um, we can easily just say, ah, we don't want you to go back in that room, so we'll just remove the choice to go back in, into mm -hmm. that room. And we can directly push the player in different directions. Yeah. Like, depending on how open or free we want it to be, we can enable and disable choices to go in different directions, but we're always in control. Of this. Yeah, um, I mean, we do do that in mm. Heaven's Lot. We will quietly turn a door off over here if you're way over there, but hopefully in a way that you never ever notice. But, mm. but you lose a lot of that focus. Mm. So I think that you asked about level design, and I think that one of the things that really took me by surprise on the project was there was a point when I realized we actually needed to do level design and we needed to know what we were talking about with level yeah. design, which we hadn't originally intended to be a thing that we needed to know. Right. Um, we were really lucky when we hired Laura Dillaway, who's our lead environment artist. We've done some level design on uh, Little Big Planet PSP and up to other titles when um, she was working at PlayStation at mm. as well. Um, and so we ended up in a process where I would kind of write a scene and say, this is what I think the, the characters are doing in this scene. And this is roughly what I think the geometry needs to be like to make that work. And then she'd take it and turn that into more of a level design space than the space with better vistas and better lines of sight and things. And then I would take it back and say, well, I think we need to put more time in here. This bit's too quick, this bit's too slow. Let's turn around, let that's too long. And between us, we could kind of thresh out a 3D space in a way that the narrative was happy, but the the 3D design of it was happy too. And actually, that process was brilliant. And I think one of the things that was really nice about it is that being a team of seven people, like we just sat either side of a table, so the iteration time was incredibly fast. So we were just bashing geometry around between us um, and coming up with these spaces that kind of flowed in really interesting ways. Um, and nice. I think that, yeah, that. that something we hadn't expected to have to contend with but actually it worked out really well but as level design go it's a fairly simple problem compared to something you know like a proper shooter game or an adventure game where you really have to think about all of those parts and all of those sightlines all the time mm. we do a little bit more freedom in, in the way that the game is made yeah that makes a lot of sense i um we got about 10 minutes left so if anyone has questions please uh get them in now or forever hold them uh there is a really good one that will take us over into the archaeology system if you have a minute, because I want to know how that whole thing works. And there's a good question here uh, from uh, Dev RSW who wants to know: Did you experiment with other difficulty modes around the translation stuff? I've been playing a lot, and I wish the game had fewer clues for those of us that love a challenge. Nope, just the right amount of clues. Thank you from someone no pressure. Who <laughs> also <laughs> loves the challenge. <laughs> you went through about twenty prototypes of the translation mechanic. Um, of all sorts of different mechanics and all sorts of different ways of of solving that high level design of decrypting hieroglyphs, which is you know the kind of the thing we wanted to hit. Um, and generally speaking, that the the window of of good game design there is incredibly tight because if you make something which is too easy where the player can brute force it, or they can just make random guesses, or they don't have to do any work, or there's no insight, or there's no structure, then there's actually nothing to do. And our, so we had a lot of early prototypes where you just lobbed words into slots, and then eventually Aaliyah would say, yeah, that's it. And you'd go, OK, that was a complete waste of time. Um, but on the flip side of that, it's extremely easy to make a problem which is far too hard. And in fact, the system we have right now, it's very, very easy for us to give you a translation, which is impossible for you to do. Um, we just use the more complicated words in the language. And there's a lot of work that went into the game to make sure that it never does that, or it very, very rarely does that, so that you don't just get translations that you have no idea about. Because then the player just disengages and says, well, I don't know, that could be anything. Um, a bit like I used to do in French class. You know, I'd look at something and go, what? Um, and that was... <laughs> Well, and bad memory, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think if people are feeling confident about playing the translation game, then that's nice. And if people are feeling that they could do better uh, with the translations in the game, then okay, fair enough. But uh, language has a problem, which is that it does get arbitrary quite fast. Like what a word happens to be mm -hmm. is really just what it happens to be. Um, yeah. So it's quite difficult to make a, a challenging language puzzle um, in the sense that you might 
mean it because actually the challenging becomes basically random or impossible very very quickly and then it's not really fun at all yeah. so we definitely rather err on the side of you know without explicitly telling you what the words mean just give you a a great amount of clues to whether it's you know where it's written um uh, what the symbols look like and or how a word relates to another word whether there's similar symbols if from that you intuit something quite easily then i kind of feel like that's a win that's a win exactly yeah, yeah. even if it feels slightly too easy that's way better than the alternative i think the other thing that people need to realize is that um it's a 12-hour game and by the end of the game, there are long and complex and intricate words that you will be looking at with deep constructional reasons behind them. And the tutorial ramp is kind of gentle. That's probably for the best. Mm. Um, so yeah, for, for people yeah. who want more challenges, I, I, I think there are, <laughs> there are plenty of challenges in there, even if it's just look back through all of your translations and even for ones where you know the words, can you work out why the word is the way it is? Mm, yeah. Like, what is the construction yeah. there? How are the symbols put together to form yeah. that word? Because there's a lot there to kind of decode. But I mean, I, th I think for us, like the, you know, it was a very iterative process and one where we, we settled on the translation me mechanic after about a year and a half of work. And after we found it and we really found it, from experiments, we dug it out of the dirt and we're like, wow, this works. And we tested it on so many people in so many contexts and it's held up for two years or something for us as being, I'm pretty sure this is the one. <laughs> like, <I'm, laughs> like, I look at it and I, I honestly don't know how we could make it better at this point because mm. like, yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Having seen the versions that didn't work, it's remarkable how well this version works. Whether you like it or not is up to you. But, um, oh my God, the other ones were a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, we're coming up to the end here. I always like to ask, and with this game more so than most, um, how did you get the word out about this game to people that would you thought would enjoy it most? It's such a tricky game to sum up easily or to very quickly give someone a sense of what they will be doing. Um, so how did you? How have you gone about marketing and, and sort of trying to get this game in front of people? Uh, has it all been like uh, YouTube, email, reviews? Like what have you? What's worked for you? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, step one is we have a PR agent who mm -hmm. helps us in terms of like she 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 um, has a specific focus on adventure games and she she has a good amount of contacts in that space, um, which helps. Mm. The uh, other thing that helps is you write a really good game that everybody <laughs> likes first, and then you email them saying, do you remember that game you liked? We've made another one. And I think that's pretty pretty fundamental, actually. Yeah. Um, it's also taken us a long time to work out what the hook of the game is. We were, we've were we been excited since the beginning about all of the kind of tonal aspects of the game, like characters, the world, the mechanics. But it took us a while to find out, purely through experimentation and talking to people, that it was the translation mechanic which really like piqued people's interest. Mm. Um, and so discovering that, um, getting that down, and always making sure that when we talked about the game, we made sure to mention we have an entire hieroglyphic language to decipher, and that mm. just became... Yeah, it the thing that we always it's mentioned. like our, our one line pitch for the game is an archaeological narrative adventure with an entire hieroglyphic language to decipher right i've said that far too many times <laughs> and, um and go, oh yeah okay a hieroglyphic language and but a lot of me wants to say oh yeah with this incredible massively adaptive narrative that totally responds to everything you do that's completely non-linear that lets you explore this massive where are you going why have we come back <laughs> why have you gone um and yeah, that's what and that's yeah. kind of that's what carries the game. That's what if you enjoy the game, that's probably what's making it good. You need that initial hook to mm. get people. That's one thing that's been nice place. about reading reviews today. Actually, is that a lot of them have gone, "Oh, there's this world, and there's people, and there's characters, there's yeah. mysteries," and you go, "Yeah, all this stuff was there." You know, <laughs> yeah. it's not just the language puzzle game. Um, but I think then that goes back to something that Mike Rose, who yeah. used to work for Garbage Sutra, said, which was projects need a hook and a kicker. Mm -hmm. And hook and you have a kicker. And our, our hook is the translation game. And our kicker is 
the massively adaptive narrative with the interesting characters and all of that stuff. And it can be really hard to package your game up that way because the kicker is probably the thing you care about and the hook is probably the thing that you're kind of done with as the developer. Like you've got over it by the time you're making your game. But um, but it is a really good way to think about really explaining is. your project yeah. to people. Like it, 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 the hook is what gets their interest and the kicker is what makes them stay. Um, and the great thing about that is you can you can be constantly experimenting with that. Every time you explain what game you're working on to a person, you try explaining it in a different way. You, you see what makes their li eyes light up. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we've, we've totally found that since we found that way of describing the game, then it's just been a question of, like, what have we done? We've done posts on Imager, we've done Twitter stuff, we've done interviews with the press, we've done demos, mm. various things. Some things have had traction, some things haven't had traction, but Mm -hmm. In general, that those concepts, that that hook concept, mm. has been has always worked. It's mm. always been there. like when we've had success, it's always been from the same hook and the same kind of payoff. Um, nice. Well, I uh, uh, I hope it works out for you guys. This game seems uh, incredible. I think we're we're just about done with our eye here. Brian, do you have any burning questions you had to you had to slip in here? Chad, go ahead, toss some toss. We got a lot of love for the language system in chat. I'll start that off. Everyone from Kale Woodbridge to Supercon Twenty Two, um, thank you all for dropping by and sharing your love for Heaven's Vault with these folks. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess for you guys, um, uh, I've been asking a lot of developers lately because a lot of developers we talked to have been building their companies um, and you know the future of their game making lives alongside their debut games. Um, you all are a few games in right now. That's you know you're not in the same place. You know how to build tools and recruit people and try to do that. Um, what there's there's a lot changing in. Um, the world of game development right now in that there's a more pressure for games, the, the making of the game to be as, as much of an entertainment as much of the product I guess as the game itself um, and I'm, while I wouldn't argue that every game developer has to jump on that bad wagon right away um, someone in here was asking in chat was asking about updates for the game and where what have you been thinking about in the way that like these kind of story driven games can exist with, with a world that's that's expanding into into games that are more persistent, which thankfully a lot of those games are still narrative and story driven. It's thankfully not narrative or no narrative. It's how is narrative presented. That's that's a que there's a question in there somewhere. There's a question mark. Yeah, it's just, I feel like I'm a bit of a dinosaur on the design of persistent evolving games because I look at something like Heaven's Vault and like it's crafted. It's got a beginning. It's got a middle. It's got an end. The idea of adding anything to it terrifies me because uh -huh. like. The narrative sticks together right now, and if I add something to it, I'm really not sure if it would stick together mm. anymore. In a way, that actually, uh, is much more difficult than say 80 days mm. because 80 days is made out of you know lots of little individual pieces that could sometimes uh, call to each other and like uh, remember certain facts between certain cities that you visit. But Heaven Vault is so just like. It's tight. It's, it's supposed yeah. to be tight. Everything relates yeah. to something um, in the core plot. So I feel like if, if we were ever to do an update for Heaven's Vault, it would have to be a sequel. Um, whereas I still kick myself on 80 Days that maybe we should have just released a lot less of the game and made it a subscription <laughs> game and then just new cities and journeys every month because we totally could have done that. New seasons. New seasons. Yep. <laughs> maybe that would have been a really great model. Or maybe we would have just like hated it within weeks. <laughs> I, I don't know. But... Um, yeah, I, I think what I want to believe is that it's still possible for us to make games, narrative games, that are so efficiently made that they mm -hmm. sell enough, that they justify themselves, that they don't need to be persistent games. We don't need to have people coming back every three months and paying another $20 for the next bit. We don't need three million players. We can get enough players who are happy with their one dollar, their one time purchase that we're, we're good, we're fine. And then that lets us make the kind of games that we actually want to make and craft the experiences we want to craft without having to try and bend like the narrative into a shape that it doesn't want to be or or like make games that don't really end like i hate it when narratives don't have proper endings it really irritates me yeah. um and i can see that in most contexts narratives are moving towards stories which don't end um because then you can make another one and like marvel are doing this right now extremely successfully and 
Um, George R. R. Martin's got his own solution, which is to just not write the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Working well for him. Um, but I, I don't want to have to do that. So. That was the sickest burn I think we've ever experienced on this channel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope George R. R. Martin, I hope he checks this game out. I think he'd like it. He you seems like a nice guy. For um, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, before we go, I'll just let Supercon get the last comments in. How you did 80 Days was perfect. The basic game was amazing, and the updates for it made them even more happy. Uh, you somehow made a great game even better. And uh, Cable Woodbridge would like to say, as a parent, hooray for short, finishable games. Um, uh, uh, I will just add, I guess, like, a key word that stuck out to me there is efficient. Um, like, having game making be efficient. Um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, seems to be something that i think everyone is trying to figure out at all times um and i hope i hope i hope that that, that i hope that heaven's vault has struck that balance for you i, I cannot arbitrarily say if it has uh, sure. in some ways it has in some ways it really really hasn't in yeah. that it took us four years um <laughs> a year longer it's, than it would be. it's certainly a lot more efficient than if we'd done it in other yeah. ways <laughs> i think this is the thing is like we have made a you know a 12 to 20 hour mm. game that's full on narrative all the time, that doesn't have any downtime in it, and there's seven of us. Yeah. And it start and it ramped up from two. Yeah. So, so it was like seven yeah. at the end. Yeah. Like I still feel like that's relatively efficient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um well, this is a, unfortunately we've hit a really heavy moment in gameplay to end this on because I believe we've just discovered uh, a slave market. Uh oof, we did. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's bad. Okay. Wish we had time to unpack that. We do not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, with that I will start wishing everyone to do um, thank you all for joining us on the GDC Twitch channel uh, this is a place where we try to talk about the art and business of making games and often where they intersect just uh, just like we discussed uh, in this moment um, uh, if you enjoyed this we would love it if you clicked the follow button uh, we would love it if you checked out Heaven's Vault uh, which is the game we're streaming today um, uh, because, you know, it's a cool game. We try to check out cool games on this channel, and we try to always be talking with the developers and give you an opportunity to ask developers about how, uh, games get made. Um, because we're also GDC, even, um, uh, we encourage you to check out the rest of GDC. We have the GDC vault up open right now. You can go check out all the talks from GDC 2019. We have a YouTube channel where those talks also wind up, so you can go check that out, too. Um... Uh, and with that, um, John and Joseph, if they have any questions for you, where should they ask them? Uh, Twitter is probably the place. Um, um, we all have a, also have a Discord server. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know how you find <laughs> the Discord server. Go to uh, Twitter and find it. I yeah. Don't know. Oh, yeah, it's on Discord. Yeah. Right. Uh, so our Twitter is at Inkle Studios, um, and you can find us there. And, yeah, please do take a look at Evans Vault. It's on PC and PS4 as of today. Mm. Mm. Right I think day one is the best day to play them. <laughs> For sure. All right. With that, everyone have a, have a good day. You too. Bye bye. Bye.